Hello, good whatever time of day it is whenever you're listening to this. I'm Andy Zaltzman coming to you not live and in zero dimensions from the shed of unfathomable factivitiveness in South London for this. Issue 4301 of The Bugle recently voted one of the top billion audio cultural highlights of the third millennium so far. And judging by the press over the last couple of weeks, somewhere in the region of 993 million of them have been Taylor Swift songs. So we've done quite well to get into the rest of that list. And today I am joined not only by producer Chris, but joining us from the currently democracy slathered nation of India, uh, it's Anuvab Pal, and from the about to dip its toe reluctantly into the puddle of local democracy city of London, Ian Smith. Uh, welcome both of you uh, back uh, back to the bugle. How's uh, how's election fever treating you both? Well, Andy, you know, I you'd appreciate this, and I'm, I'm doing this little stunt just for you, Andy. Okay. Uh, about an hour ago, I, I voted uh, in the Indian elections. The voting booth in Mumbai is at the Royal Opera House, a British oh, right. institution. <laughs> I don't know what that says about the Indian democracy, because <laughs> they have picked one of the last Victorian relics in Mumbai to have voting, and... I have requested a room with Wi-Fi to stay back to do the bugle. So this recording is courtesy of the Election Commission of India. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got, I mean, can everyone do that? Can can you know if all if all one billion voters demanded a room with Wi-Fi to record a, a podcast? Presumably, they'd have to they'd have to do that now. They'd have to give everyone one. And and you know, I, I thought you'd appreciate this, Andy, because you like quirky things. There is only one room that has Wi-Fi in an entire <laughs> voting building, which is equally concerning for the world's largest democracy. Uh, Ian, have you voted in the Indian election yet? Um, yes, I have, and right. if anything, that shows that there is wide-scale corruption going on. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, it shouldn't have been that easy for me to participate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's running. I... Um, I just ticked. I ticked a random box. It didn't. I don't think I ticked a name either. I. Um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> I think that's one of the um, electoral symbols, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crossed fingers. Um, I think I've got an outside chance. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I would, I'd love to see you as Prime Minister of India. Ian, I'd, I think that would make the world yeah. a happier place. I'd love to see the moment it was announced. And you just see me going, oh, God. <laughs> I feel a bit out of my depth here. <laughs> well, you, you know, know you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be the first Prime Minister coming to office to look like they felt a bit out of their depth, to be honest. I mean, gentlemen, I know that you, you, there is much mirth in this discussion, but I have to say that Ian Smith uh, against Prime Minister Modi has had as good a chance as the rival Congress Party of India. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, basically, think, mm-hmm. second equal. Yeah. 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 I don't I'm think we to... needed an Ian Smith running an ex-colony again. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, you may know a comedian, uh, Tadawa Malunge, um, and he started doing material about um, how there was a man called Ian Smith who runs Zimbabwe and was a very evil man, and he, and he's talking a bit about that. But he he's done that at gigs where I'm comparing, and then I have to <laughs> go on immediately after him and go right. It's not me. <laughs> well, you know, that's uh, yeah, I, I I've never found myself in that situation. To be honest, the only other Andy Zaltzman I've come across after an extensive internet search was a guy who swam in the Maccabee Games of 1981. Um, so uh, an American <laughs> called Andy Saltzman. Now, yeah. I mean, pers- I've, I can barely swim at all, so I was quite excited to find that it's not just due to my name. We are recording on the 26th of April, 2024. On this day in 1564, uh, just 460 short years ago, um, celebrity playwright William Shakespeare was baptised in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, although more accurately given the information available at the time baby William Shakespeare was baptised he wasn't yet uh, a celebrity playwright but he did soon become a celebrated writer in fact less than a year later the infant Shakespeare wrote what is now considered his first masterwork a recently discovered poem 
Um, and as you will hear, the baby shaky certainly observed the first rule of writing, writes about what you know. This is uh, considered to be his first complete work written uh, at about the age of nine months. Bring forth unto my lips, unto my quivered more, the once, twice, thrice bidden teat, where from life's sweetest nectar springs to quell the ragings of these ravened guts, this hungry soul. And ye shall end the wails that rend this air as quiet, and then again I slake the anguished longing of this parched, despairing throat, and toothless, voiceless, helpless, clasp unto this bestial flesh, and swift ingurgitate the nurture from within. And then, when all is done, when sated into slumber droop these eyes, as oft the heron barks upon the shore, I shall uncork the burdens of my soul to fill once more the swad beneath my core. So, really, I mean, pretty, pretty impressive stuff from the uh, baby Shakespeare about uh, needing a feed and a shit. Um, so, in, uh, <laughs> on this day, in, I, um, uh, I knew I recognised you um, as the voice of the audiobooks for Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But that, that, that was that's not the Fifty Shades of Grey, the novel. That's uh, that's my new range of uh, of hair colourings that's coming out. Um, uh, coming Andy, out I'm also very concerned that just then you transformed into my twelfth grade Anglo Indian English teacher, <laughs> Mr. Wheatley, doing his version of Merchant of Venice. <laughs> there are so many shades of uh, yeah. Andy Zaltzman. Yeah. Um, one day I'll do a show called that. <laughs> <laughs> She will disappoint everyone on an almost <laughs> infinite number of levels. Um, oh, on this day in 1865, a uh, bad day for a renowned Shakespearean actor, John Wilkes Booth, um, who was one of the leading Shakespearean actors of his time in America, but who did prove the theory that no matter how good you are at your main job, no matter how many absolutely top-notch reviews you get, if you assassinate a six-foot, five-inch tall president, people will mostly focus on that when they look back at your life uh, and career. And also, it's a happy 1,903rd birthday to uh, former professional emperor Marcus Aurelius, the pin-up boy of Roman stoicism who died in the year uh, 180. But to be fair to him, as you'd expect, hasn't complained about it in public since. He just took it, he accepted it, and he moved on with his lack of life in the proper stoic manner. Anyway, he was born on this day in 121. As always, a section of the bugle is going straight in the bin. Well, we hear a lot about home improvements, but do you really want to improve your home? We live far too insular and sedentary lifestyles. So uh, a new trend sweeping the, world is, uh, sweeping the world is home impairments to make your home much, much less nice to spend time in, to encourage you to get out more and enjoy life as it should be lived. And we have the bugle home impairment section for you this week, telling you how to achieve a termite infestation in your sofa, the best way to position mirrors to make sure that when you're watching television, the sunlight glares in your eyes no matter what angle you tilt your head at do you have a problem with wet rot good we'll tell you how to make sure it spreads to all rooms in your home how to corrode your water pipes quickly and humanely uh, how to deseal your windows to make sure more of that precious dampness dribbles into your plasterwork and of course the best time uh, to pour a cup of tea down the back of a cupboard and we review the latest uh, new home impairments uh, tech accessories hyper allergenic carpets uh, rather than stopping you uh, be allergic to things it's encouraging you to be allergic to things guaranteed to make you sneeze and go outside for a walk. Uh, the Eraticorp Capriccio shower, a shower that randomly varies between icy cold, scaldingly hot, a power jet hyperblast and barely wetting dribble. Uh, and the Iratech Bluetooth Permus speaker, a wireless speaker that you can't switch off that links up with all your social media accounts to play music that you certainly will not like and to tune into talk radio stations with political standpoints you are diametrically opposed to. Uh, plus the Snooze Rumbler slope bed, which begins the night level but gradually over the course of five or six hours tilts slightly to one side so you'll find yourself sliding annoyingly out of bed in a gradual manner so it annoys you for a long time before you actually do anything about it all of these will make your home less nice to live in and make your life considerably better that section in the bin i'm a little concerned andy that sounded like a list of chris's last 10 christmas presents <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, that's why Chris does so many triathlons. It's <laughs> not to it's not not to keep fit. It's not to to see the world. It's just uh, just to spend less time in his house. Just makes for some awkward regifting. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd be more inclined to watch uh, DIY SOS if what they did is they went to someone's house, they told them how how much of a hard time they were having, and then they just knocked their staircase out <laughs> and just left. Yeah. Oh. 
I mean, it's, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new, uh, new frontier in television. Top story this week: Apocalypse Now. Um, well, Apocalypse Now is not just the title of one of the late 1970s most unsettling travel documentaries with some of the weirdest breakfast recipes, napalm in an omelette. Yeah. Just remember, things don't always taste as good as they smell. Uh, nor is it just the name of the best-selling end-of-the-world-themed teen magazine of the 1980s, uh, which was full of lifestyle and fashion tips on how to get through the annihilation of everything, looking trendy and ready to fall in love. But also, Apocalypse Now is a question people around the world have been asking in earnest this week. So this could, in fact, as we record, be the last 26th of April of all time. So it could be a really I mean, historic uh, tw- 26th of April uh, on those grounds, because the signs are that this rickety old planet of ours is revving itself up for some pretty hefty Armageddonical end time ca- cataclysmagorical apocalyptics uh, in the very near future. And if we needed any further proof, it came in London this week as blood-soaked horses rampaged through the streets of our city. Ian, I mean, that's our apocalypse right there, isn't it? But blood-soaked horses rampaging through London. Yeah, I mean, horses rampaging is bad, but the addition of blood-soaked has, <laughs> has really, really made this hit home. Um, <laughs> but this is just uh, this is Sadiq, Sadiq Khan's London. Yeah, Susan is, Hall, yeah. Susan Hall's right. There are no go areas in London <laughs> because you cannot move for horses because he's tried to implement zero emissions to such a degree <laughs> that he won't allow cars anymore. Right. Um, but yeah, the, these horses were they were on a on a rampage and they were moving very fast, roughly one horsepower each behind them, <laughs> and um, what. One of them crashed into a parked double-decker tour bus. Um, and I really like the idea that the person doing the tour announcements has had to improvise with that event <laughs> happening. <laughs> Just going on your left-hand side, there's uh, Nelson's column. Oh, on your right-hand side, there's a horse's head through the windshield <laughs> now. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, my favourite quote from all, all of this was reading the Guardian article. And it said, a number of personnel and horses have been injured and are receiving the appropriate treatment. The word appropriate seems (laughs) redundant there. Because it seems to imply that sometimes, or there's an option that they may have received the inappropriate medical treatment. (laughs) But in some articles, they'll go, um, well, he had a serious concussion and we've amputated both his legs. And that that man has received the inappropriate (laughs) medical treatment for the situation. (laughs) Um, I mean, it was it was terrifying, Anivab, uh, seeing this unfold on television, a trail of destruction and perturbed cyclists as these horses, uh, which w- were apparently spooked um, uh, whilst uh, gearing up for uh, some sort of procession uh, in the Buckingham Palace area. Um, and two of them ran uh, almost six miles from near Buckingham Palace all the way to the to the east. And obviously we, sh- we wish all horses in the past, present and future well um and uh, our thoughts go out to the entire horse community but i mean i i, I, I you, you probably would quite please not to be in london during this well, absolutely terrifying incident it's a good point andy you know i mean i'm used to seeing quite a few domestic and wild animals on the urban streets of india so there isn't that element of surprise you know there's there's often a horse in the wild in my neighborhood <laughs> right next to starbucks so that allows <laughs> for a nice conflict of civilizations, if you will. But honestly, I, what I really miss uh, about London, gentlemen, is there aren't enough wild horses. Yeah. As, as you know, you know, I'm a big fan of medieval Britain. I'm a big fan of Victorian Britain. And I think two or three things that you could bring back to London that's really missing. And maybe whoever is the mayor can do this. More wild horses, uh, beheadings. I All don't right. know why you guys stop that. Yep. Um, throwing feces in buckets out of windows. That was very big in Shakespearean times. I don't know why. That's what that made him what he was. Away. Yep. Yeah, and no indoor plumbing. Um, I, I believe that <laughs> some modern London apartments, tiny apartments, have gone back to those days where there isn't any indoor plumbing. Um, but I really, I, I really want to make an appeal for bring Victorian London back in, in whatever way 
possible. I mean, I think that's pretty much what the Brexit campaign was based on. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> it might, might, might get some support. I mean, it was just reading the headlines in the newspapers, get out of my nay, dishorse her on the streets of London, nags away, <laughs> harried horse escape as Colts yeah. bolt, hoove the f*** was that, and things are gelding out of control. Uh, the more broadsheet headlines, London under quadrupedal hooved attackers, horses seek revenge for thousands of years of human subjugation. Spokes horse claims this is the start of something big. Financial Times, FTSE wobbles as prospect of equity control of London spooks markets shares down by 0.0003% during uh, five minutes of panic and uh, the Telegraph uh, well as you were suggesting Ian um, Labour Mayor Sadiq Khan unleashes plague of communist horses on London um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's it was uh, it was very 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 concerning uh, indeed. I mean, one uh, a couple of the horses uh, have been uh, quite seriously injured. One horse called Vida could be ruled out of ceremonial horsing uh, for some time. Possibly even have to retire from being a ceremonial horse and have to make a living as a celebrity horse. Maybe going to reality television uh, might make Celebrity MasterChef a bit more exciting if one of the celebs is a horse, especially if one of the other celebs is French. Uh, before uh, eventually. Uh, moving on to the uh, after-dinner neighing circuit. But apparently it, it all started when the horses were spooked by something, possibly a loud noise from a building site. Possibly they saw a copy of Liz Truss's book in a shop window. Um, maybe they just realised the tragic nature of being a horse in a human world, destined forever to live without true free will. Maybe it was a belated realisation that Brexit would never be what they dreamed it would be as horses. Or maybe they just suddenly reflected on the general state of the planet and the growing sensation that humanity has willfully pissed away not only its best years, but also the future of the natural world. So, I mean, who knows what sparked this horse horse rampage off? But I, I hope that it's it's not going to lead to you know a, a daily rampage of feral horses through the, the streets of our fair city. Ian, have you ever ridden a horse? Um, no, but I've ridden I've ridden in a sort of old ye old wooden cart being pulled by a horse. All right. Well, so. I was in a BBC adaptation of Noah's Ark. All right, um, yeah. And um, I had to play someone who was, like, comfortable around horses, not someone who is visibly on camera <laughs> scared of horses. <laughs> and I don't think I pulled that off. But, it, <laughs> but the yeah, the horse just kind of bolted. So I was just holding on to a wooden cart to see where the horse would take me. And then the guy in charge of the horses kind of caught it. And I was like saying, I'm going to get off the car. And he was just laughing, going, oh, no, come on. And I was like, the horse nearly ran away. And he just keeps laughing at me. And I think it was the only my deaverish moment in in TV when I I told this man really pathetically, stop laughing at me. I'm scared of the horse. (laughs) Which... um, it's not the I, highlight of my career. I think no. Ian has a very good point, and I just want to lodge a general complaint here, which I've wanted to do for years on the Bugle, about celebrity animal trainers. Um, right. I just want to point out that they're a bunch of bastards. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. Primarily because you know I I was once on a set for a thing I had written, and there was a lion on set, and the only person who has the information as to whether the lion is going to bite your head off is the animal trainer. Right. And he is not someone who should have a sense of humor. Right? <laughs> That's not someone who should be witty. And this guy, exactly what happened to Ian, every five minutes kept saying, oh, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't do anything, wink. I, 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 I mean, this is a giant man-eating beast. I, I don't want jokes here. There's some right. places jokes are not necessary. Mm-hmm. But you did um, say you, you'd, writ- you'd written that script. I, I had written a script which featured right. a lion, which yep. was then... Acquired. Well, well maybe next time production. write about a gerbil or a hamster instead, <laughs> yeah. and you'll, yeah. you'll avoid yeah. that, that difficulty. Yeah. But I'll tell um, you what, Andy, yep. that gerbil trainer will be a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so, as well as a, a plague uh, of horses, uh, other plagues are sweeping the world as the apocalypse comes, uh, comes closer, including... Uh, a new virus spread by a naughty little insect called a mealybug, which could result in the end of all chocolates, unless it doesn't, which it probably won't. But what if it does? Uh, as John Lennon famously sang, imagine there's no chocolate. And Now, Ian, you are, of course, the Bugle's confectionery correspondent. Mm. Um, how will our once great chocolate-addicted species cope if these insects steal our one remaining source of joy and solace from our weeping mouths? Well, exactly. I mean, I, I don't think we will. I, I personally would be quite happy to um, to just call it a day 
if right. chocolate's not around. Yeah. Um, I I feel more worried about this than I did COVID, and I've, <laughs> I've had COVID. Right. <laughs> um, but this is apparently um, um, a disease um, ravaging uh, trees called swollen shoot virus, which um, I believe can transfer to humans. Um, <laughs> I think I've had that before, and it's oh, very right. painful. Yeah, I think Lord Byron had it after a brief and intense dalliance with a Venetian ballerina. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, it's worrying. Um, and so a lot of um, it says here that Ghana has lost more than two hundred fifty-four million cacao trees in recent years. So I think we need to start um, getting rid of some of the less popular chocolate. And I think right, okay. it's about time we got rid of the coffee revel once okay. and for all. Right. Yeah. Just to save a bit of um, the resources. <laughs> I'm in complete agreement with Ian. Chocolates have had it too good for too long. Right. Um, and I think someone's got to now have a word with chocolates. Okay. And I think this, this virus comes at a good time. Because throughout human history, no one, not one French emperor, you know, no one in the Mughal emperor sat down and said, what the hell is going on with chocolates? <laughs> right. It allowed the hipster generation to happen. Right. It allowed, you know, films to be made, whole literature around chocolates. Not one person was a conscientious objector. Everything right. has had objectors. You know, India had Gandhi, the French had the French Revolution. Where is the, where is the Lenin for chocolates? Yeah. The, the time is now. I mean, to describe the French Revolution as uh, objectors, or indeed Gandhi, I mean, that's... That's downplaying things uh, somewhat. <laughs> it seems to be a little bit of an, an objection going on um, as, as, the, as the guillotine <laughs> sweeps down. Um, uh, heat waves have apparently made the situation work, uh, worse because uh, the mealybugs, um, uh, they are in the sum bit of the like it hot Venn diagram. Um, and of course, uh, in heat waves, the chocolate melts on the trees, um, which makes it harder to, to harvest. Uh, as well um it's unclear what the motivation of the mealybugs uh, is why they're taking aim at uh, one of humanity's most beloved uh, beloved snack stuffs but rumors suggest they are bored with nothing to do apart from infect cacao trees and are held back by a lack of hope and aspiration that besets so many insect species these days so and i don't know what can be done uh, ian uh, i mean do you have a do you have a plan for the global um uh, other than sort of getting rid of the the sort of less less good quality snacks that you don't personally like well what are you going to do to save the global uh, c chocolate industry well I, I think we do we probably need to market vegetables so that they're more <laughs> fun so that <laughs> demand goes down a little bit okay um so i think um i think kinder eggs should be swapped with it's like a toy just wrapped in a lettuce leaf <laughs> um as ways to make vegetables sort of more fun is yeah basically put toys in vegetables is, is my answer all right okay yeah well i can i can see that i can see that working like a, a, a courgette with a little car in it mm. yeah all right we're, we're making a better world um in other plague news um south carolina one of the best known carolinas in the usa has been beset by a biblical plague of horny cicadas Trillions of the frankly f***ing revolting looking bugs have been popping out um, and the boy cicadas uh, immediately uh, on emerging from uh, years underground they set about finding a mate by making as much noise as possible they truly are our biological uh, soul mates um, amongst the quite literally and metaphorically and above all numerically thousands of different species of cicadas around the universe most most of which live here on earth of course only 10 species are considered periodical in other words they have a life cycle that involves the young cicadas living underground for years never going out before emerging en masse and causing havoc which is basically what much of human life has has become and what's happening this year is that two broods with different dormancy periods are emerging at the same time uh, for the first time since 1803 brood 13 um one of the classic uh, classic broods uh, they have a 13 year um uh, dormancy sorry it says brood 19 has a 13 year dormancy period uh, wait until they hear what's happened to America since 2011. And Brood 13, ironically, 17 years. They don't even know the bugle exists yet. What a surprise they're about to get. I think they're the last Brood unaware of the existence of the Bugle podcast. Um, but these two Broods haven't been out in the same year 
since 1803, the year of the Louisiana Purchase, when France tricked America into buying a load of what they assumed was dud land because it has trillions of cicadas uh, all over it uh, uh, at the time. Um, so, um, I mean, it's uh, these things are, uh, well, I mean, clearly, they're f***ing horny. They've spent years and years underground, and uh, they come out, they've got about four to six weeks to get shit done, and they want to get shit done just going to say i visited south carolina only once it happened during the spring break season and i heard very similar noises from the college <laughs> students um who i don't know how long they've been underground but but they emitted similar kinds of noises uh, ian are you are you concerned about uh, you know the these these horny cicadas you know spreading from america where they belong to to, to the rest of the world and i mean even london after the, the horse incident mm. this week who, who knows where it could end I get my my main sort of um, gripe with this story is I've sort of I felt a bit sad that um, I'm not a sort of ye old seventies style male comedian, right? Because I I was reading the article and, and a lot of the jokes I could think of it seemed like they would come from um, like I, I was reading that the the, um, the noise they make can be as loud as jet engines and scientists who study them often have to wear earmuffs to protect their hearing and i feel like a 70s comedian would have fun with that of just being like sounds like the wife <laughs> <laughs> loud as a jet engine got to wear earmuffs when you're listening to her Fuck, we've all been there um but um and it's yeah it's just a shame it's a shame, a shame yeah. that those comedians have been driven into the ground yeah. by Thank you, Brussels. society progressing. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in the world we can end with Thank You Brussels with. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in the other apocalypse coming news, uh, well, I mean, often one of the, the, the most common signs of the apocalypse is things speaking in tongues, or people speaking in tongues, speaking incomprehensibly. But could it work the other way round? Because a spacecraft that has been talking absolute f***ing gibberish at us from 15 billion miles away has suddenly apparently started making sense again. And if this does not signify that it's trying to warn us uh, that the end of the world is coming our way, then I don't know what is. I mean, this, this complacent spaceship 47 years ago was launched from Earth. It's 15 billion miles away. It's been, I mean, it's, what, 30-odd years past its best when it last saw a half-decent planet. It's been doing absolutely f***ing all frankly apart from floating into the infinite void of space suddenly it gets back in touch with us clearly it's going to warn us that there's some sort of platoon some fleet of alien spaceships heading our way to bring about the end the end of our species i think i think we should all be shitting ourselves frankly i just find it annoying that they've been able to fix something that's like 15 billion miles away because my letting agent can't fix my <laughs> boiler <laughs> and it, as far it's as I'm too... aware, that's not a trans-Neptunian object. Right. But it's, or maybe he's too close, your, let, your, your letting agent. I mean, maybe mm. if, if the, the boiler was 15 billion miles away, it might, might be easier. So I should, I should attach some rockets to it yeah. and try and get it out into space. Yeah. OK, right, I'll be back in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, I mean, like I said, it's made me feel inadequate. We have a light in our living room that has a faulty switch. <laughs> And all we need to do is replace the switch and it will be fine. It's feet away from where daily we sit on the sofa. And I reckon it's at least 12 years that this, this switch has been faulty. And we haven't fixed it. And, you know, if I can't get the Bluetooth on my Bluetooth headphones working within a minute, I just give up and start singing the songs myself. And yet NASA, in just a few weeks, have fixed tech that is not only 15 billion miles away but tech that is basically nearly 50 years old as well i mean this is really this is really making me feel like i have not embraced modernity as i, I will admit nasa you're better at tech stuff than i am i'm gonna just lay that out there can um, i just say I'd... i found the story very relatable you know okay. it just because i think it's very much like my comedy career you right. Know, just asleep for about 30 years. Some <laughs> gibberish insight for about a year's touring. Yeah. And then asleep for another 30. So I think, I think I, 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 if anything, this was a resume builder for me. I, <laughs> I said, oh, this is sort of how my career is shaped as well. I, I always like the, um, the rooms with all the sort of the experts in with space stuff. Like when, when a mission succeeds or something lands, 
and they all sort of get up and they're, they're punching the air. Because it, it looks like people celebrating a sports event, but they look like the sort of people who would not have any interest in sports whatsoever. <laughs> so it looks like a stag do made up entirely of the one person on the stag do who doesn't like football and is trying to pretend he does to bond with all the other people. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that is what NASA is, essentially. I think that's why, why it was set up originally. Um, well, I was going to say, I mean, it's a long long way. 15 billion miles away can seem quite hard to understand, so I'm going to put it in terms that normal people should be able to understand, but maybe not if they work for NASA. That is almost a quarter of a trillion football pitch lengths away, um, or the same distance as unicycling 600,000 times around the equator, or running 500 million marathons dressed as a dinosaur. Uh, it's also the estimated distance between Donald Trump and reality uh, currently. So that's 15 billion miles, and yet they've still managed still managed to, to make it talk. This is, I mean, it's an amazing achievement, isn't it, te technologically? It's just annoying that it's in an area of space where there isn't anything. So they've, they've got it to talk, and all it's going to say is, yep, nothing to report at the minute. <laughs> Just, I'm f bored. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get back that's to you in about thing. twenty years. Yeah, I mean that's the exactly that's the thing about NASA job profiles that fascinate me. Um, I love watching NASA documentaries because they always interview this guy and they ask they ask him what's your job profile, and his job is just to stare at the third moon of Saturn <laughs> and the lake next to it for years. <laughs> and he, and nothing happens. You've got to think to yourself, at some point he's going to turn Buddhist or shoot himself. I mean, he's just, I mean, how long can you stare at Titan, one of the moons of Saturn, hoping some shit goes down? Um, yeah. You know. I, I mean, it would have been nice if, if Voyager had got back in touch and just said, I've just passed uh, an old-looking guy with a great big white beard looking very cross. Um, <laughs> but I think that would have... I mean, that might help the world, actually, if you get that kind of message coming through. Wasn't there some story last week about how space is just full of junk now? There's a lot of 60s stuff from just the things banging into things because it just looks like the back lot of an Asda. It's just <laughs> loads of crappy metal just piled up and things. You know, it's like driving just to the outskirts of Mumbai where it just looks like hell on earth, just burnt <laughs> cars, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's what space has become, really, and you know it shows that you you've got to get fifteen billion miles away to to, es to escape humanity. Uh, Venice has started charging people a fee uh, to go in. Apparently, it's the first uh, scheme of its type, um, charging people five euros just to go into uh, the city, unless they're staying there overnight, in which case you need a QR code proving your exemption. Uh, the result of this, uh, total f***ing chaos. Um, it's, it's split opinion, this scheme. Um, Venice um, struggles with the sheer weight of tourism, which is its own f***ing fault for being such a magically beautiful place, and it really should have thought of that before it designed itself. Um, but it's a slightly curious... Uh, means of stopping Venice seem like just a tourist attraction by charging people to enter it as if it is just a tourist attraction. I, I don't in entirely follow the logic of that. You don't have to pay, as I said, if you stay overnight in Venice. So, again, it's an attempt to stop Venice becoming populated exclusively by tourists by encouraging tourists to stay in Venice. So th there's a few kind of logical issues with that. Five euros, though, I mean, it does seem like a bargain. Venice is f***ing amazing. I mean, that's also not to say that the Bugle live shows in London won't be good value at around, what's what, three or four times that price? It merely encourages us for those shows on the 2nd and 8th of June at the Leicester Square Theatre, tickets available online, uh, which just encourages us to make sure the quality of those shows is so high that it feels worth a four-day holiday in Venice. Um, so... Uh, uh, Ian, um, what do you make of this? I mean, you, uh, you're from, uh, you grew up in Ghoul in, uh, in Humberside. Do you think, I mean, what, what sort of level do you think the, the Ghoul should set to charge people to, 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 to go in as tourists? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to be too hard on Ghoul, but I think if we did a five pound entry fee, it would be a ghost town. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone... I think it would just be bypassed completely. Um, motorways kind of redirected around it. Just like, where have these guys got this arrogance from? Um, yeah, it does feel weird. Like, £5 is... 
I don't think is a deterrent because if you can afford like four hundred pounds like hotels or flights or a cruise and if someone then says oh it's an additional five pounds to go to venice i can't imagine anyone going oh well this is just outrageous now (laughs) everything is adding up this is just getting this is untenable we'll cancel the holiday and then being told well you only get half of the fee back if you cancel it i'm not going to pay five pounds extra (laughs) um yeah, it just it just doesn't seem like um, enough money. And yeah, the idea that like then people just think, oh well, if it's five pounds to visit for the day, let's let's go for three days where they don't charge you and you can stay over. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess people have said that it's sort of turning them into a theme park. Um, but um, the people behind the decision have said that the big wacky slide that goes directly into water is just a coincidence. Because um, a, a lot of locals have been asking why there's a helter-skelter slide coming out of St. Mark's Basilica. <laughs> um, but they've said it's just part of the um, architect's original design yeah, plans. Yeah. Yep. yep, that's fair. Um, but yeah, some of the, the residents are very angry. There's been local meetings and protests. Um, and just to sort of hammer that home that's a a local meeting of angry italians so some of the hand gestures going on would have been insane <laughs> i was told the slide was built by cosimo de medici in the yep. 14th century i believe it was just yeah. a, um can i just say gentlemen i think every city needs to have a fee yeah. um there should be fees that you should pay a beautiful city to visit and there should be fees a city should pay for you to visit if it's a shithole. Um, <laughs> so what are you wanting from Dubai, Anuvab? <laughs> At least 100 dirhams. <laughs> and my clothes, which is a reasonable ask. Um, I'll give you an example. City of Agra has the Taj Mahal, beautiful city in India. If you want to see the Taj Mahal, should you pay 100 rupees extra? Maybe. I mean, they already fleece you enough, but why not a little more? Um, the city of Kanpur in India, most polluted city in India, <laughs> they should pay a thousand rupees for you to visit. Um, and I think every city should have some economic fee associated with its aesthetic beauty and history. I think London must be quite highly regarded, judging by how much I'm paying to live here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in other travel news, if you can call it uh, travel news, um, the uh, UK has been condemned by the uh, Council of Europe's Human Rights uh, Organisation uh, over the passing of the Rwanda Bill, which has finally got through Parliament. This, with an election looming, um, is being seen as a triumph for Rishi Sunak, that he's managed to force through a scheme that has made Britain a global laughing stock that won't deal with the problem it's pretending to deal with, and that manages to pull off the rare political decathlon of being deranged, ineffective, incompetent, expensive, inhumane, illegal, illogical, embarrassing, and unpopular. So quite how and why the government expects it to make them seem more popular and less incompetent. That remains shrouded in the kind of fugged mystery that 2020 politics seems to uh, t- seems to specialise in. Um, it was discussed on Question Time last night, and Chris Philp, Government Minister, um, seemed a little unsure uh, during the debates on Rwanda whether Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo are different countries or the same country. And this this is what we've become as as a nation. This 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 is what we've this is i mean it does mean that you know maybe it's open to all of us to become cabinet member. in fact i've got a could you be a british cabinet minister quiz uh which you bugle listeners can do uh, now i'm going to ask you this uh, these questions and just answer from the multiple choice options are rwanda and the democratic republic of congo different countries a yes b no c not sure d too early to say or e yes but they're basically the same aren't they i mean they're miles away and i think they're both in africa uh, question two will sending potentially up to eight or ten asylum seekers to rwanda lead to vastly improved public services across the united kingdom a obviously not don't be fucking ridiculous b yeah probably or c not only that it will also lead to a golden age of british greatness and pretty much every single country in the world applying to join and or rejoin the new relaunched and revamped british empire and question three 
Uh, this is the scenario. Brian owns a car. The car has a flat tyre, but Brian needs to drive to the golf club. So Brian dresses up in a pagan outfit, fills the car with straw, sets it on fire, sacrifices it and dances around it as it burns, chanting strange incantations to a mythic god he doesn't really believe in. Has Brian adequately dealt with the issue of the flat tyre? A. No. Clearly he hasn't. B. Yes, he has. There was a problem. Something had to be done. He did something. No one else came up with a better idea. Problem solved. Now, as long as you didn't answer A to any of those questions, then yes... You could be a British cabinet minister. So this is the exciting thing with uh, having politicians uh, like this humiliating themselves on national television. It shows what is possible for all of us. Um, Ian, I mean, with the election coming up, um, obviously everyone's very excited about, uh, about it. Do you think this is going to shift the dial at all? Will there be now maybe two or three people who might vote Conservative at the election? Yeah, well, it will take... I mean, at the minute, it feels like everyone thinks it's a stupid idea and doesn't want it to happen. But I think if they can get some people sent to Rwanda, everyone will think it's a stupid idea and didn't want it to happen. But I reckon two or three people will admire the persistence. <laughs> um, because it, it, looked like it, it looked like it wouldn't happen. It looked like it shouldn't happen. It looked like it was illegal and humane at some points. And after that, that sort of setback, a lot of people would stop doing something. But but they've persevered. <laughs> and it, it's very admirable. Um, yep. there, there was a Home Office minister um, who said um, that there were people determined to do whatever it takes to try and stop this policy from working. But that's just because it is a bad <laughs> po- policy. Yeah. It's bad, and there's lots of legal arguments against it. And I don't think I made a very good analogy i think i was quite tired when i wrote this analogy but i've i've written here it's like having made a car entirely out of marshmallows and then when someone points out there's nowhere to put the petrol you saying it's like you're determined for me not to drive this marshmallow car <laughs> <laughs> i think that's entirely valid it's brilliant you put yeah. it in, yeah. in accessible terms that everyone can understand but mm. as you say you've got to admire the persistence it's like aristotle famously said if you keep putting your penis on the same barbecue eventually someone is going to think it's a sausage so you've <laughs> just got to have that faith that persistence <laughs> to, to go through with what you believe in this is why it's so important, Andy, to have a classical scholar <laughs> in this podcast. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it's, just, it's needed. Um, just very quickly, I just want to say, you know, I know they decided on Rwanda uh, as the country, but going forward, could they keep it quite flexible? I saw a travel airline in the UK called TUI, and they had an offer where you get on the plane and you buy a ticket and they fly in the middle of the night and they take you to a mystery destination. Yep. And you land and you find out you're in Anatolia, Turkey, and that's your holiday. Um, I mean, given it's pretty cruel as an idea what they're doing with Rwanda anyway, could they make it even more cruel and just have the plane land up in any country? <laughs> uh, and then have that country deal with the legal ramifications, I, given it's not legal anywhere? Uh, to be honest, I think that's a dangerous thing to say out loud. Um, <laughs> and you just don't know. You never, as they used to put on those posters in the Second World War, you never know who's listening. And it's it's possible that Chris Philp is li- is listening to this, and this this could would make its way into uh, into uh, into public policy. Um, well, I think it's time to wrap up uh, this bugle now because we all have to go and make our final preparations for the end of, of the world. Um, we were going to do a quick update on the Indian election, but since it's going on for so many weeks, Anuvab, I think we can get you back on again before the election is completed um, to uh, to talk us through it and the uh, various um, not entirely sensible things that uh, Narendra Modi has been uh, has been saying. Um, so, uh, that brings us to an end. Don't forget to buy your tickets for those two bugle live shows in London on the 7th and 8th of June. Are there any tickets left, Chris? There are four very limited seats in the corner of the Saturday oh. and a, a, about 20 or 30 for the other date. All oh, right, OK. Well, um, well, if you're so disappointed that you can't go to the um, Bugle live shows in June, never fear, because from the start of November, I will be on tour uh, for quite a long time. Um, the dates will be con- confirmed and announced I- uh, by the end of May. Uh, I've been reliably informed. Um, there are lots of dates around the UK, some in, in Europe, uh, uh, well, other parts of Europe. <laughs> Clearly the UK is in, in Europe. Uh, I'm, as I've said before, I'm from Europe. I grew up in uh, Tunbridge Wells, which is a lovely European town about uh, 900 miles north of Barcelona. Um, uh, anyway, the to- I will full information 
world exclusive uh, a reveal i will have a special reveal show of the tour dates on the bugle in uh, a few weeks time um ian anything to plug um yeah on tuesday the 4th of june um i am filming my edinburgh show um with another very funny comic stuart laws at the pleasance theater in london um so it'd be great if anyone could come to that because it will be the one that remains online forever <laughs> so if it could be a nice one with nice people that would be that'd be very good so um yeah you can get tickets to that on the pleasance website and uh, where are your new zealand shows oh and the new zealand gigs are on at the classic um in auckland and i'll be doing 10 solo show dates there and various other things so yeah if there's any um new zealand buglers i'd love to see you there uh, there are quite a lot of New Zealand buglers, I think, from I've not been there for a, a, a few years. So, and the classics are lovely venue, isn't it? In, uh, yeah, yeah. Auckland, yeah. Um, uh, Anubab, plug away. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to be on a short tour of the UK, uh, seventeen towns, um, promoting Britishness. As you know, Andy, I feel like <laughs> the time has come for a middle-aged Indian person to look at the glories of Britishness because you guys are not doing it. You're just <laughs> running, running down your own people. Um, and the Department of Britishness goes on tour, uh, starts at South End on Sea and ends at the Soho Theatre on the 8th of June. Um, it starts on the 17th of May and I'll be going to British towns I haven't been to ever, but uh, I'm hoping to run into some Indian thing there that was picked up and brought back <laughs> <laughs> as a memento. So I should be able to to see some relic of empire across. Um, and yeah, it's called Department of Britishness. All the tickets are on my website and I will, uh, along the way, be glad to update everyone on Ian Smith versus Narendra Modi, <laughs> the Indian election <laughs> that's underway. Fingers crossed. Chris, you've got something to plug. Yeah, I've got a new series of my podcast, Travel Hacker, which is out now. It's the sort of show you never knew you needed. Do you want to hear about line bikes? Obviously. Do you want to hear about the merits of electric cars? Maybe. Mm. Do you give a shit that the London Under Overground changed its name? You probably didn't know it had. <laughs> it's all that kind of stuff in the show. So right. Listen. And all the latest on the uh, the horse routes through London as well. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening, Buglers. We will be back next week with Alice Fraser and Alistair Barry. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>